Think of this for a moment. All that's required to put the science of getting rich to work in your life is a decision. Now, do you know, most people will look at that and they'll say, there's got to be more to it than that. How many of you have been trying to earn a lot of money for quite a long time? How many have difficulty at it? Do you know, 1% of the population earn about 95 or 96% of all the money that's being earned. And it's a subject that is not taught in school. And when someone comes along and tells you, all you have to do is make a decision, we have a difficult time buying into it because we've probably worked fairly hard attempting to earn money. Now, I stumbled on this information around 43 years ago. I have been absolutely fascinated with it ever since. It takes up all my days. Some people ask me, what are your hobbies? Just studying this subject. That's all I do. And I have worked all over the world with this. And it doesn't really matter where you go. You can go into different countries, into different cultures. When you get past the culture, people are essentially the same. And I think we all want generally much the same thing. I had a man sit down with me in 1961. And he put an R on the sheet of paper, just like what you're looking at there. Then he put three letters down beside it. And he said, Bob, let that represent happiness, health, and wealth. And then he asked me if I thought he was a happy guy. And I said, yeah, he seemed pretty happy to me. And he did. He said, have you ever seen me when I was sick? And I had to admit I hadn't. He said, have you ever seen me when I was broke? And again, I had to admit I hadn't. Well, he said, you've got to be one of the most miserable people that I've ever met. And I was. I was an unhappy guy. I was 26. Um, as I look back at it, I think I was an unhappy kid that just grew up and stayed that way. And I believe a lot of people live that way. There's a lot of unhappy people around. Um, I, I didn't have a terminal illness, but I always had a cold or a headache or a backache or something. And when it came to money, I mean, I had a problem. You see, as he said to me, he says, you're striking out in all of these areas. I was actually earning $4,000 a year at the time, and I owed six. Now, you know, that's not an uncommon position for a person to be in. If I took everything I earned for 18 months, nothing to live on, and just paid debt, I would have just broken even. So when you look at that, you know, there's not a lot of hope. I, um, I don't think I ever thought I'd get out of debt. It never entered my mind that I could. I never really thought of earning a lot of money. Um, I, I was just trying to keep the wolf away from the door. You know, the phone would ring every day, tell them I'm not there, you know, or where's the money? And, and hell, I thought, if I knew where the money was, you wouldn't have to phone me. I, I, it, this, this was a constant problem. I have often said that you'll be absolutely amazed how much free time you have when you never have to think about money. Do you know that people spend an enormous amount of time thinking about money if they haven't got it? Now, if you have got it, it's a totally different story. And I really believed, I was raised with the idea, if you're going to earn a lot of money, you've got to be really smart. And if you're going to earn a lot of money, you have to uh, have a great education. You have to have uh, a lot of experience. But that's not what this man told me. Now, that's the man that I sat down with. His name was Raymond Douglas Stanford. Now, he's been gone for a long time. But that guy made a bigger difference in my life than anyone that has come into my life since then. Now, the little boy that he's holding, I named Raymond Douglas Proctor. That's my son. Now, that little boy today is six foot five. He weighs 240 pounds and he has no hair. He has three little boys that are all bigger than him. So do you see, I'm going back quite a ways. But this guy, he really woke me up. He asked me some good questions and he got me thinking. Now, this is the one thing he asked me, he said, or, or suggested, and I found this in a book by Vince Rawazzi over here in Philadelphia. He said, to change your life, you have to change your life. Now, that sounds like a play on words. It did to me the first time I looked at it, but that's not a play on words. That is so basic. And it's so misunderstood because it's an inside job and we're forever trying to change things outside and that's not where it's at. 
We keep gathering information, gathering information, and it doesn't do it. I think once we get hooked on the idea of developing ourselves, we never get away from it. And the people that are not hooked on the idea, they think we're a little crazy. But I wouldn't want to live in the world they're living in. You know, back in 1970, I had the pleasure of being on a program in Chicago with, uh, with just an incredible man. He wrote a book called The True Believer, Eric Hoffer. And he said something on that program that stuck in my mind. He said, in times of change, the learners will inherit the earth, while the learned find themselves beautifully equipped to deal with a world that no longer exists. Now, run that through your mind for a couple of minutes. In times of change, the learners will inherit the earth. I took that to be metaphorical that we'll be happy, healthy, and prosperous. Well, the learned find themselves beautifully equipped to deal with the world that no longer exists. You see, there's no such thing as a learned individual. There's no such thing as an educated individual. That's a misnomer. We're either learning or we're not. Napoleon Hill talks about education coming from the Latin educo, meaning to educe, to develop, or to draw out from within. So you see, we don't even have to get anything. As we really start to understand what makes everything happen, we're going to find out that we've already got everything we need. It's simply a matter of becoming aware of it. And so Ray suggested this to me, and then he introduced me to the book. Now the book was Napoleon Hill's book, Think and Grow Rich. I have never stopped reading this book. The book that I carry with me, I've been carrying since 1963, and I read it every day. Now, I think Hubbard pointed out that when you read a good book through the second time, you don't see something in it you didn't see before, you see something in yourself that wasn't there before. Yeah, you see, it's the repetition of the right information that'll really alter what's going on inside, and that's what you have to do. Everybody thinks it's something outside we have to change. We have to change companies, we have to change cities, we have to change jobs. Uh-uh, you gotta change it inside. If you don't change it inside, nothing happens. Well, I got into that book and I started to study. Now he said, there's a secret in that book. And he said, if you find a secret in the book, you can have anything you seriously want. Well, I thought that was a gross exaggeration. You know, you can have anything you want. Let me put it in proper perspective for you. I was 26. I had two months high school formal education. I had no business experience. I had an absolutely terrible work record. Um, and in, in here I'm reading that you can have anything you want. Now, there's so much about ourselves that we don't know. And as I started to read this book, he said, there's a secret, you can give anything you want if you find the secret. Well, that was sort of like trying to sell me on the tooth fairy. And of course, I was 26. I thought I was pretty cool. I thought I was wide awake, you know. And actually, I was in a deep hypnotic trance. And, 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 and I was ready to reject it. But Ray said to me, he said, listen. He said, you're not very happy. He said, you're not the healthiest guy in town. You're always broke. Now, he said, I found out something about money. And he pulled out a big wad of money. He always carried a lot of money. And I was always fascinated with that because I never had any. But at any rate, he said, this stuff can't talk, but it can hear. And he said, if you call it, it'll come. And I thought, God, you know. Uh, that's sort of a nice idea, you know, and I was ready to start hollering for it. But he said, you've got to understand how to get it. And he said, you obviously don't understand. Now, he said, the author of this book studied the lives of 500 of the world's most successful people his entire life. Then he put it in this book. Now, he said, I'm inclined to think that he knows something that you don't know. Well, I think he just sort of put me in my place. You see? And so I started to read the book, and I found the secret. And the secret was so basic and simple, everything changed. Do you know a year later, I was earning 175000 a year, and then I took it over a million dollars a year. I mean, I had money coming in from all over the place. And, and it happened so fast. Yep, but he said that in the book. He said, when money starts coming, it'll come so fast and so furious that you're going to wonder where it's been hiding through all those lean years. Well, boy, I thought this is it, you know. And it was, it was, I had it coming in from different countries, from different cities. And somebody will say, well, what were you doing? I don't think it matters what you're doing. I think what matters is how you're doing it. Do you see, Wallace Waddles wrote a book on the science of getting rich way back in 1903. He says, you don't get rich by doing certain things. You get rich by doing things in a certain way. And I thought, uh-huh. Yes, you could find two people doing exactly the same thing and you couldn't see the difference. 
But one's doing it a certain way, the other isn't. It has to do with intent. It has to do with the energy that you're doing it with. You see, we're taught to be good little go-getters. Go-getters lose. They blow it. We want to be good little go-givers because the law says what you put out will come back. The universe will reward you by law. This is, this is all very scientific. Yet it happens with every person every time. Now, I found the secret, and it was pretty basic. It was simply sit down, decide what you want, write it on a card, carry the card in your pocket, and read it as often as possible every day. So I wrote on the card that I wanted to have in my possession by New Year's Day of 1970, I gave myself a decade to do this deal, and $25,000. I really didn't believe it would happen. But you know something? I kept reading it. I don't know why, but I kept reading it. I did exactly what the author said. I kept reading the card. And I kept reading it, and I kept reading it. Now, because I kept reading it, I started to think of earning money. Prior to that, I was thinking of debt. If you had asked me, I would have said I was thinking of earning money. I wasn't. I was thinking of debt. If your goal is to get out of debt, I guarantee you'll probably be in debt till you die. Because we become what we think about. Yet whatever you think about, you attract. You literally magnetize yourself to it. That's all I was ever thinking about was debt. But I started to think of earning money. Somebody said there's good money cleaning floors. So I said, I'm not proud. I'll clean floors. Well, I started to clean one office. Then I got another one. Do you know in less than five years, I was cleaning offices in Toronto, Montreal, Boston, Cleveland, Atlanta, London, England. The thing took off like a rocket. Now, what really changed? I think something inside shifted, but I didn't know what it was. And I bought this book and I was giving it to everybody. And nothing happened in their life. Then I got into Earl Nightingale's condensed narration of the book. And I would drive around with a portable battery operated record player and I would keep playing that record over and over and over again and everybody was starting to wonder about me Proctor's listening to this guy talk to him and he's saying the same thing because it's on a record I mean he doesn't change the story and I'm listening to this and I'm reading the same book I was starting to wonder about myself but everything just kept changing kept changing kept changing and I'd give the record to people and I'd give the book to people and nothing happened so I reasoned that someone had to know why I changed, and they've either written it in a book or they're talking about it. So I made up my mind, I would read every book that was ever written if I had to, but I was gonna find out what happened to me. So that's what we're talking about. Now, I wanna suggest that you make up your mind you're gonna get in what we call the success zone. It's, it's a way of thinking. Now, get this. If 95, 96% of the population are blowing it, if 1% of the population are earning about 95% of all the money, you're not going to get a whole lot of people agree with what you're doing. <coughs> Most people are going to look at you kind of strange. What are you going there for? You went there last month. What are you listening to that for? You listened to that before. What are you reading? What do you read the same book over and over for? They don't understand. And you see, they're advertising their ignorance by the questions they ask. When we get into the success zone, everything in our life starts to change. But understand this, you're going to be a bit of an odd. You're out of the box. You're not one of the masses. And when you get out of the box, your whole world starts to shift. So as we go through this, let's think. Let that little yellow dot on the screen represent your level of awareness. This represents your level of awareness. This is what you're aware of. Now, everything you've got in your life, everything, your relationships, your money, everything, is an expression of your own level of awareness. See, people that earn 50,000 a year are not earning 50 because they want 50. People are earning 50 because they're not aware of how to earn 150. People that are suffering from headaches, they're not suffering from headaches because they want to suffer from headaches. They're suffering from headaches because they're not aware of how to eliminate the headache. It's their head, they made it ache, they can make it stop. So do you see, it's awareness we're after. Now think of this. If that little dot represents our awareness and it's responsible for everything we've got in life, just think of how your life could change if we magnify it just a little bit. I mean, everything would start to change. Our relationships would change. We would be healthier. We would live in healthier bodies. We would know more people. We'd earn more money. We'd be able to do more interesting things. And if we just increased it a little bit more, everything starts to shift. Well, I've been living this way now for 40 years. It absolutely fascinated me. I celebrated my 70th birthday last week. I got more energy than most people, 20. I have absolutely no intentions of slowing down. People should say, you should slow down. 
That's a bunch of crap. We should speed up. We've got more power. Yet, do you know the, the most erudite scientist alive can't even guess at what you and I are capable of doing? No one knows what we're capable of. All the power is omnipresent. That's within you, within me. Slow down, we're just starting to warm up. What we want to do is calm down. You can go at warp speed and stay very healthy if you stay relaxed. And that's really the secret. Now, just imagine we expand our awareness a little more. Do you know what this program is doing for you today? It's expanding your awareness. That's what the program is all about. Every time you come, every time you come to one of these programs, your awareness is widened. Your world starts to change. You think, oh, yeah, that's pretty interesting. And it just keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Our awareness keeps changing. Do you know that no one knows how much money you're capable of earning? There's no one can even guess at what you're capable of earning. We want to become aware. We're like we are because we're not aware of how to do it better. We know how to do it better. Every person in this room intellectually knows how to do a better job than they're doing. Everyone in the room knows how to earn more than they're earning, but they're not doing it. You see, having the knowledge is not the deal. Having the knowledge, I mean, uh, well, I remember when I was a kid, a school teacher would say to me, Bob, why did you do that? I'd say, I don't know. W what do you mean you don't know? You know better. I know. Why would you do it? I don't know. I was in the Navy. Every commanding officer, Proctor, why did you do that? I don't know, sir. What do you mean you don't know? You know better. I know. Why would you do it? I don't know. You see, I didn't know why I was doing things. Do you know that we do things that we don't want to do? It gives us results we don't want to get, yet we do them anyway. Do you know what addiction is? It's never getting enough of what you don't want. Yet a lot of people are addicted to results that they don't want. Why do we keep doing it? Do you see, I think when we start to see that, that's when we start to become aware of how to take control over our life. And that's really what we want to do. So do you see, awareness is the big deal. We want to become aware of the obvious opportunities that are available to us. We are surrounded by opportunity. There, everywhere you go, there is an abundance, there's no shortage of opportunity. We can win and we can win in a big way. Now, when we lack awareness, we miss the opportunity. I used to always say that, you know, the trick is to be in the right place at the right time. I've been in the right place at the right time many times in my life, but I blew it. You know why? I wasn't aware that I was in the right place at the right time. I had to look back at it. Think of it. There's something else. It's being aware that you're in the right place at the right time is not good enough. You've got to be aware that you're in the right place at the right time. Now, do you know that you're in the right place right now to get some information that will literally transform your life? And it's like I said, I've got license to brag about all this information because none of it's mine. I guarantee you, when you walk out of here at the end of the day, your head's going to be spinning because this is good stuff. What's holding most people back? Here's your answer. It's paradigms. Now, that's sort of a buzzword, but that is really what stops us. It blinds us. Paradigms actually blind us. Now, I'm going to get into paradigms, how they're formed, and uh, what they are, and then how to change them. You see, if you get into books on psychology or psychiatry or behavioral science, you'll get a definition of a paradigm, but it's usually so big and, uh, and uh, awkward that you don't understand it. The book was probably written for other psychiatrists or psychologists or behavioral scientists. And the average layperson doesn't understand it. I had great teachers, and they broke everything down into the simplest possible form. And I found out that paradigm is nothing but a multitude of habits. When you wake up in the morning, you move into action. There's a routine to everything you do. There's one to everything I do. If you're living with someone, you could set your clock by that person and they by you. When, when I put my foot in my pants, I put my right foot in first. I don't know which one you put in first, but I do know this. If I put my left in first, I'd probably fall over. I would be staggering all over the place. Why? It's programming. That's how programmed we are. We're programmed to drive the car the way we drive it. We're programmed to dress the way we dress, to walk the way we walk, to talk the way we talk. Our whole life is written program in here. And you know something? We didn't even write the program. 
we didn't even rate the program. Do you know that they're other people's habits? You and I are the product of somebody else's habitual way of thinking. It's genetic and it's environmental. Why do you think you look like your relatives? Do you think it's an accident? It's what's programmed right into the genes at birth. Yet we grow up and we live that way. Why do we speak the language we speak? Do you know that if you had been taken out of your home and moved to the suburbs of Beijing when you were an infant, you'd be fluent in Chinese and have absolutely no knowledge of the English language. But by the same token, if somebody had been taken out of Beijing, put here, same thing would have happened. We're programmed with other people's prejudices. We're programmed with their limitations. Do you know that most of the limitations we've got, we don't even know where they started. I'll give you an example. When, when Linda and I first met, we, we were out shopping, and uh, uh, I said, you know what I would like is turnip. She said, okay. So I picked up a turnip. And she said, what are you going to do with that? I said, I'm going to eat it. <laughs> well, she said, I'm not eating that. Well, I said, why not? She said, that's the root of the turnip. I said, it's the what? I had never heard it called a root. It was always just a turnip. Well, I said, what do you eat? She said, we eat the green of the turnip. I said, my God, we give that to the pigs. <laughs> well, she said, we give the root to the pigs. I don't even know if I ever saw a turnip green. So here we are eating the root, giving the green to the pigs. There they are eating the green and giving the root to the pigs. Now, I was raised in northern Ontario. She was raised in, uh, in Pensacola, Florida, and Birmingham, Alabama. Two totally different cultures. You see? So I put the turnip back. I thought, what the hell? There's no sense in fighting over a turnip. You know? <laughs> but I'm wandering around the store, yet I'm thinking, who decided we'd eat the root of the turnip? I don't think my mother woke up one day and said, we're going to eat the root of the turnip. I wonder why she ate the root. I don't think her mother did. And then I started to think, I wonder how far back in our family I'd have to go to find out who decided we would eat the root of the turnip. How far back I'd have to go in her family to find out who would eat the green of the turnip. And then I started to think, you know, it really doesn't matter. But the principle behind this is huge. Because you know, most of our habits are like that. They really are. Now think of this. What do most people do when they begin to have financial trouble? That's, this is paradigm talk that I'm dealing with here. What do they do? I'll tell you exactly what they do. They lower their standard of living to meet their income. That's a bad idea. That is a terrible idea. Timidity is not a strategy for the new economy. We're living in a new economy. Remember, you cannot move forward when you're cutting back. Yet, does it? Why do we do it? We're programmed. That's what we were taught to do. Anything else is being irresponsible. Well, let's think of this for a moment. Successful people take their income up to meet their standard of living. Do you know why? They understand how to do it. And if you don't understand how to do it, you're in bad shape. But when you do understand, you don't need to cut back. Never need, I've, I've been working pretty closely with a fellow. In fact, we just came back from Europe. We were over all through Germany and over into Finland. And uh, he had uh, had a bit of trouble with money here just within the past year. And he was, uh, put his house up, he was gonna sell it. He said, what the hell are you selling your house for? Well, he said, I, you know, I can't afford to keep it. I said, you can't afford to sell it. No, I said, you've got to make a decision right now. Do you like the house? Yeah, I don't want to sell it. Then don't sell it. Just figure out how to earn more money. And so the two of us got working on it, and his problem was solved. It was simply a decision. Well, that's all we need. See, we're living in a new economy. The economy that you and I were raised in, that's not the economy we're living in anymore. It's a totally different world we're living in, but we're still operating with all the old habits. Now, Gates said one thing is clear. We don't have the option of turning away from the future. You don't have that option. No one gets to vote on whether technology is going to change our lives. It's, it's here. This is the deal. You either fall in line with the new rules or you're going to lose. It's that basic and it's that simple. There's nothing complicated about it. You see? Now, here's three great, great questions. 
You, you want to you wanna remember this because this can change your life like night and day. It's so basic and so simple, you could miss it. One, what am I doing? What am I doing? Number two, what works? What works? Number three, what doesn't work? Now, when we've analyzed this, let's make up our mind that we're going to stop doing what doesn't work and take all that energy and, and, and that time and put it into what does work. Do you know if that's the only thing you got out of this entire meeting this afternoon, it could be worth millions to you. Literally millions. I picked this up, I don't know if I heard it or I read it, but there was a man who had an engineering company. He did about 10 million a year. It wasn't a big company, but it wasn't a corner store. And he died. His wife had nothing to do with the business. She never went around the business. So everybody just assumed when he died, she would sell the business. But she didn't plan to sell the business. After the funeral and things slowed down, she went into the company and she called all the heads of departments in and they're the three questions she asked. What are you doing? What works? What doesn't? She told them to stop doing what didn't work, spend the time at what does work, and she took the sales from 10 million to 25 million. She just went in every now and then. That's all she ever did. I wonder what would happen if that's all we did. We want to understand and apply if we really want to get into the science of getting rich, the law of compensation. Now, the law of compensation is pretty clear. There's nothing complicated about it. The law of compensation clearly states that the amount of money you earn is always going to be in direct ratio to the need for what you do, your ability to do it, and the difficulty there would be in replacing you. Now, do you see, if we really study this, there's probably quite a need for what you do. Now, I don't know how proficient you are at doing it. Most people learn how to do something, then they never improve upon it from that point on. Once we learn how to do it, we just keep doing it at that level. That's why most people read at a grade seven level. They never learn how to improve upon it. You see? The third one, the difficulty there will be in replacing it. So you see, if you analyze this, you're going to realize that if you just focus on number two, number three is going to take care of itself. Number one's already taken care of. There's probably a great need for what you do. Now, if we become very, very good at what we do, just keep perfecting what we do. If we sell, let's really learn how to sell. Keep getting better at it. You would become very difficult to replace. Now, I've always felt for salespeople, and I would imagine quite a few of you are in sales, you want to learn to master your presentation. Most people make a terrible sales presentation. Just absolutely terrible. That's why they don't do very well. I have gone into companies and watched sales go up by hundreds of millions of dollars and we tell the people not to work as hard. See, we've got the idea in our mind, if you're going to earn more, you've got to work harder. Bad idea. Now, think of this for a moment. I want you to think about your financial success. And, 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 and don't think for a second that you can't change it. You can change it, you can change it dramatically. But really think about your financial success. You see, these meetings, these seminars, they can change your financial success like night and day. There's nothing that'll do it better because it's information that we're getting about ourselves. Now think of this for a moment. Money makes a big difference in all the important areas of our life. You'll hear people say, well, money's not everything and money won't make you happy. That's an absurd statement. Money was never meant to make us happy. And since it doesn't make any difference whether you have it or not as to whether you're happy or not, you might as well have it. Yet, at least if you're miserable, you'll be miserable in comfort. I mean, there's some consolation in having it. You mm see? -hmm. Now think about it for a moment. Money is meant to make us comfortable. The more comfortable we are, the more creative we'll become. The more creative we are, the more service we can render. The more service we render, the more money we will earn.
Don't spend any time thinking why you can't. Just think how you can. You know something? You do it. Anybody in this room can turn their but you're not going to do it by accident. You're not going to do it unless you decide to do it. Now you'll say, I don't know how to do it. Hillary didn't know how to get to the top of the mountain when he went up it either. He didn't. He tried in 51 and he failed. He tried again in 52 and he failed. Yet in 1953, he and Tenzing Norgay stood in the top of the world. Now I have worked with him on two or three occasions. He's a, just a nice guy. The, the only thing different in him than, that I could see in me is his side. He's got a hand that would just wrap right around my hand. Big guy. No one had ever been to the top of that mountain. Do you know a thousand people have been up there since? Things don't happen unless you decide they'll happen. Well, anybody could make that happen. I was flying to Kuala Lumpur, oh, back around 1990. And I, uh, I like playing with words and numbers when I'm on a plane. And, and I'm, I'm not a good flying partner. If you sat beside me, you'd probably think I didn't have any social intelligence at all because that's my time. And so I sit there and I write words and I write numbers. And I remember I wrote the word commission one time, and all I could see coming off the page was mission. And I made a program called the Mission in Commission. And there is a people that all are in the big commissions. They're involved in the mission. They're not involved in the commission. And it's a paradox, you see? Yeah, because they're not doing what they're doing for money, and yet they wouldn't do it if they weren't being paid. Yet it's, it's real paradoxical. You could get your head all messed up if you play with it long enough. But I sat down, and I wrote a one and six zeros. And I took a look at it, and I thought a million. You know, we've written songs about a million. We'll say, what would you do if you won a million? Oh, I don't know what I do, you know. And we, we have all these little games that we play. Line up for blocks. I saw, I saw a sign coming in here, just driving into town that, where they had a big sign up. There was a million in the background and there was 31 million or 390 million or something in a lottery, you know. And there'd be all kinds of people look at that and think, oh, wouldn't that be nice, you know? Well, anybody can do this. And I got thinking about the people that I knew had earned a million. Hell, I earned a million, and I didn't even know what I was doing. You don't have to be very bright to earn money. And, and the, there's enough evidence around to prove that. There's all kinds of people that are functionally illiterate. They can neither read nor write. They're multimillionaires. Yeah, there's people walking the street who are absolutely brilliant, and they're broke. Think about it. That's got nothing to do with being intelligent. It has nothing to do with gender. It has nothing to do with geography. It has nothing to do with working hard. I did a TV show with Robin Leach a number of years ago. He's probably interviewed more wealthy people than anyone alive. He told me the wealthiest people he knows, he's never seen them work. Now you could be sitting here thinking, well, what the hell do they do? You know? I mean, that sort of scrambles our head. Because we've been trained, you've got to go to work. Well, here, here's another one. This, this is, you know, like the three questions. This is another one that you want to burn into your mind. This is something most people don't know. They don't teach this in Harvard. They don't teach it at Wharton. They don't teach it at Eton or Stanford. This, hardly anybody understands this. It is, and, and I understand it. So, I mean, it's not too difficult to learn. There's three strategies for earning money. I refer to it as M1, M2, and M3. Yet when I started to explain this to Linda, her head would go, oh, 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 because it's so obvious. Now, if you're going to teach your kids anything, and understand this, which you don't fix, they'll inherit. If you're going to teach, teach them how to earn money, because if they're not earning any, they're going to have a bad life. People that don't earn money raise skinny kids. I mean, it's just not a good way to live. You know, it really isn't. Now, M1 is used by the masses, but M3 is the one you want to teach the kids. See, M1 is used by 96 people out of every 100. It is without question the worst way in the world to earn money. It's working, that's right. It's trading time for money. Now, if you have any money later on in life, by following this strategy, it's at the expense of a life. You have been earning a bit and you've been squirreling some of it away, but that's at the expense of the car you want. You never drive the car you want. People, most people look at a car and they think, oh, oh and I ever like to have that. And while they're thinking why they can't have it, somebody else is thinking to buy the whole dealership. You see? Yeah, they're using the same mental faculty and they're drawing on the same thought power. This is a terrible concept. Trading time for money. You will never get ahead of the game doing it. M2 is a good strategy, but it's only used by three people out of a hundred. 
That's where we invest money to earn money, which is the probable reason why there's only three people out of 100 using it. Investing money to earn money. Now, some people are very good at investing money. They do very well. Most people are not. The ones that are doing it, the, the, the ones that win at it are in the minority. Now, this is the one I stumbled on way back in the early 60s. Had no idea what I was doing. No idea. But it happened. I moved from M1 to M3, just woo, like that. It took me nine years to figure out what I was doing. Did not understand, and yet you see that 1% earn 96% of all the money that's being earned. Now this group here, they multiply their time by setting up multiple sources of income. They don't have one source of income, they got lots of sources of income. And you think, but well, how do you get to that point? You, do, you get there by deciding that's where you're going. I mean, how are you going to get home? Are you going to walk out of this theater and say, God, I don't, I don't know what to do? Well, you're either going to go home or go to your office or go somewhere, but you know where you're going to go. And that's how you're going to get there. You're going to think, am I going to walk? Well, I don't think I'll walk while I drive while my car's here. I probably should take it with me, you know? And, and this is all. It's a process that you do. It's all automatic. This is a process that's automatic. You see, if you can earn a hundred, you can earn a million because you're following a basic principle. You see? It's, it's just a basic principle. Once you learn the basic principle, you're going to follow it. Now look at this for a moment. Your PSI is your psychic source of income. Your psychic source of income. This works for everybody all over the world. See, we should have a psychic. That's what we work at. We wake up in the morning and we start doing what we absolutely love to do. I always find it amusing that I can be so well paid doing what I love. I love doing this. I absolutely love it. Yet, and, and I earn ridiculous sums of money for doing it, but I'm doing what I really love to do. That's what we should do. We should all do what we love. It's a psychic source of income. We can earn all the money we want. We can stay healthy. We don't need to react. See, if you do something, I react to it. You're in charge of me. The second you react to situations or circumstance or other people, they're in charge of you. So here you are, the only life you got, and it's a relatively short one, you know, and, and we're putting other people and things in charge of us. We were bouncing around. Our head is like a ping pong ball. That's the way many people live. It's no wonder their body's breaking down. This damn thing is in such a chaotic vibration, it has to break down. It's just a mass of molecules, and you should keep it in the right vibration. To improve your performance, you have to follow the ancient advice, know thyself. Ray Stanford asked me, he said, do you know who you are? I said, do I know who I am? Yeah, I know who I am. I'm Bob. No, he said, that's who you think you are. That's not who you are. He said, Bob and Proctor are just two words. That's your name, but it's not you. I said, what? Well, he said, you're not your name. I'm not my name. Well, that makes sense, doesn't it? I'm not my name. Okay. I said, well, this is me. No, he said, that's your body. You've never heard anybody work phone into work and say, body's not coming in today, it's sick. You never heard anyone say, am hand or am leg. We say, my hand, my leg, my name, my body. These are all things we have. He said, your results. Now, I knew I was in trouble. I was 26, I was unhappy, I was sick, I was broken, I just found out I was lost. I didn't even know who I was. You see? Well, if you're going to know yourself, if it's, you know, if you're going to change your life, you've got to change yourself. If you're going to change self, you have to know who self is. Now, think of this for a moment. You and I have infinite potential. Now, I said before, I don't know how much infinite is. I just know it's a lot. It has no beginning and no end. That's, that's the potential we've got. We've got all of this power. Yet, if you watch the way most people live, you would think that they were just about out of juice. A lot of people, when their heart stops beating, it's going to be a formality. I mean, they just... They just sort of sit. They never really get it going. Yet we have infinite potential. We're dealing with something pretty big. If we're going to find out something about ourselves, we have to look at this. You say, this is over my head. No, it's not. I teach this to kids. I got it. This all tied into the science of getting rich. Rich resources are lying dormant within us. Andrew Carnegie told Napoleon Hill, he said, any idea that's held in the mind, that's emphasized, that's either feared or revered, will begin at once to clothe itself in the most convenient and appropriate physical form that's available. 
You see, Dr. J.B. Ryan said the mind is the greatest power in all of creation. Very few people understand it. If you go on our website, you just go to bobproctor.com, you'll see a quote there by Dr. John Mike, a psychiatrist from Florida. He said, I taught him more about the mind in one year than he'd learned in four years of medical school, five years of psychiatric training. And what I taught him was just what a Dr. Roder taught me. I was always amazed by that. I thought, what do they teach you in medical school? You know, and, and what we're doing is getting in at the non-physical side of ourselves, and that's where all the power lies. It's a beautiful concept as we start to understand it. What do we need? We need understanding. You really want to change your income, you've got to change your understanding. Now, there's only two things you have to know to really make things happen big in your life. Number one, you have to know where you are, and number two, you have to know where you're going. Now, you see, most programs get to focus on where you're going. That's very important that we have a goal. You've got to know where you're going. But what happened to me that was totally different is Ray Stanford got me to focus first on where I was. He got me to look at what I was doing with my life, got me to take responsibility. He said, your results aren't bad and they're not good. They're just, just results. Nothing's bad or good except our thinking makes it so. He said, you have to ask yourself, are those the results you want? And I said, no. Well, he said, if you will pay attention and you'll do what I suggest, I can show you how to change it. You see? And my whole life started to change. Most people get us focused on the goal. If we don't know where we're at, we're not going to... Let's suppose we all bail out of a plane and safely land somewhere on the planet. Our objective is to get to this room. Now, we know where this theater is. We know where this room is. Our problem is we don't know where we are. Now, let's say it's overcast. We'll build a ridiculous situation. It's overcast. Um, there's um, no street signs. There's no wind. Uh, there's no compass. There's no map. There's no people. But we know we're on the north. I mean, we could be in uh, Milwaukee heading towards the Canadian border. We could be in Los Angeles heading towards uh, Tijuana. You could be in Atlanta heading towards uh, Miami. We could be right outside this theater and walk away from it. If we don't know where we are, it won't matter where you're going. So you see, we've got to take a good, honest look at ourselves. What am I doing? What works? What doesn't? Who am I? And as we really get a grip on this, everything in our world will begin to change. You see, what we're seeking always is greater awareness. We're always wanting to raise our level of, res a level of awareness because our results are an expression of our level of awareness. And the only way to improve results is to increase our level of awareness, all right? Now, effective goals inspire us to move to increasingly higher levels of awareness. Now here, yes, what you'll find that people say they want. They want greater health, happiness, peace of mind. All these results are the, are the result of a higher level of awareness. So it's awareness that we should be seeking. We want to raise this and everything else starts to happen. It happens like unadulterated magic. That's what happened to me and I couldn't understand it. Now there's a basic law that said everything in life is either growing or dying. It's either create or disintegrate. So you're never going to stay where you are. Your results are going to get better or they're going to get worse. It's create or disintegrate. No one stays where they are. Now, the truth is, I think most people get a little better and a little worse, a little better and a little worse. When they get a little better, they're forcing it, but force negates. You see, there's something inside of you that's urging you to grow. This is the spiritual side of our personality. It's the essence of our being, and spirit's always for expansion and fuller expression. There's something in you that wants you to grow. If you run, you want to run faster. If you jump, you want to jump higher. If you sell, you want to sell more. This is good. It causes dissatisfaction. Dissatisfaction is a creative state. My grandmother pretty well raised me and she taught me that I should be satisfied with what I've got. Grandma was wrong. I should be happy with what I've got, but never satisfied. It's dissatisfaction that gave us the incandescent light. It's dissatisfaction that gave us air travel. It's dissatisfaction that gave us the internet. All those things were always here. People just became aware of them. The way to fly an airplane was always here. We can go all over the world now. We're not a long ways from anywhere. We're only a short period of time away. But while there's something inside wanting us to grow, there's something else that's trying to stop us. And that's the old paradigm.
Now, you've got the one side that wants you to grow and the other side that doesn't want you to grow. The old paradigm does not want you to grow. Anyone that has smoked and quit smoking, I used to smoke. I quit years ago. But I remember it wasn't an easy thing to do. It was not, why? Because it was a habit. Habits are not easy to get rid of. Habits are ideas that are fixed in here that control us. Many of you have gone on diets. You want to lose weight. I'll just toss something in for your benefit. When you lose something, you're programmed to do what? To look for it. <laughs> get rid of the idea of losing weight. Release it. Release it. See yourself at your perfect weight, looking good and feeling great. Your whole life is controlled by images. Get the image of the body that you want to live in, of the world you want. Quit trying to lose weight. Just release it and see yourself the way you want to be. Now, goals determine which side wins. The goal must be something you really want. Each time we move to a higher level, the results improve. And it just keeps getting better and better and better. And that's the way life should work. And it can work. Now, you and I think in pictures. We think in pictures. Okay? You don't think B-O-A-T. You don't think G-E-A-R. You don't think F-B-A-T-H or B-I-R-D. You think in pictures. You think in pictures. Now, it's the mind we're talking about I want you to tell me what your mind looks like. What's your refrigerator look like, John? What color is it? White. Two doors? Top and bottom? Which way do they open? The right to the left or left to the right? Left to right. Now you were mentally in your kitchen looking at your refrigerator, weren't you? What's your car look like? White? You like white, dude. <laughs> what's, what's the interior? Charcoal gray. Charcoal gray. Two door, four door? Five doors, okay? You've got the picture of that in here, haven't you? Tell me what your mind looks like. Gray mush. Gray mush. <laughs> now you're doing what probably a lot of people are doing. How many saw the brain when I asked you to think of the mind? Hold up your hand if you did. See, there's a whole lot of people doing the same thing. But your brain is not your mind, John. And your brain is not your mind. Your brain is an electronic switching station. That enables you, by using certain cells in your brain, to alter the vibration that this body's in. The brain is an electronic switching station. No one has ever seen the mind, and that is why most people have such great problem. Because we think in picture. Now, when there's no picture, John, there's confusion. If there's confusion inside, you can make book on the fact there's going to be confusion outside. As we bring the picture to our mind, we bring order to our mind. What did Solomon say? Where there is no vision, the people will perish. Where there's no vision, there's no order. Where there's no order, there's no growth. And that is what changed my life as much as anything. As I started to see how to work with my conscious and subconscious. Do you know certain things about your subconscious mind? Because you've read about them, you've heard about them, you listen to it on tape. But without a picture, it's just words. You see, when I asked you to think of your car, John, I activated vocal cords, I made a sound, it's called language or words, it was actually a light message. Your hearing sense picked up that light message, it was rifle fired down a nerve passageway in your body, it struck a group of cells in your brain that that sound resonated with, all electrical. Those cells increased in amplitude of vibration and the picture that was in them flashed on the screen of the mind and you saw the white car in the charcoal gray interior. When I asked you to think of your refrigerator, light message struck those cells in your brain, picture come on the screen of the mind. When I asked you to think of your mind, you saw your brain. And yet your brain is in your mind. Your brain is in your fingernail. It's in your kneecap. And you know something? You'll never enjoy health if you don't really be able, if you're not able to get a picture of the mind. You'll never enjoy health. Because good health is when a body is in a good vibration. It vibrates in harmony with God's laws. Most doctors do not understand this. We have taught this to a lot of doctors and it changes their practice like night and day. It'll change your communications. If you're in sales and you don't understand the law, you're on a hit and miss basis and it'll probably be more miss than hit. When you understand the law of vibration, you're gonna understand that you're transmitting through the medium of the molecule pictures into the other person's mind. And you wanna put pictures in their mind that are favorable to them if you want them to be favorable to you.
about thinking in pictures. If you're going to rearrange the furniture in your room, you get the picture of where you want things and then you move the furniture there. Everything we do, we do it in our mind first. When we don't have a picture, we have confusion. If you try and get two pictures in your mind at the same time, you're in a confused state. So, when we start thinking about ourselves and we realize we're spiritual beings, we live in a physical body, we have an intellect, that becomes a bit of a problem. How do you see that? How do you get all that? And it becomes too confusing, so we stop thinking about it. Now, this is what I call a magical graphic. This is the genie. This picture or this drawing was made by a Dr. Thurman Fleet in San Antonio, Texas, back around 1934. He realized, if we take this back a bit, that most of the healing arts dealt with the physical. If you're treating the physical, you're treating a symptom. You're not treating the cause of the problem. A lot of people are into holistic healing today. That's heal the whole person. And he knew that they had to be healed spiritually, intellectually, and physically. And he knew that there was a problem because of thinking in pictures. And that's when he came up with this concept of the mind. Now, when this was first explained to me, uh, it took me a while to really grasp it. Because I was getting it confused, different things. So if you look on the inside of the sheet that we give you, uh, you'll see uh, the drawing there and we'll fill in some of the blanks for you. I let this drawing represent me. If I think of me, I think of this drawing. If I think of the drawing, I think of me. I see my head as my mind and everything else, the neck down from the body. Now I'm well aware that that's not the way the mind is. Mind is movement, body's the manifestation of that movement. But since we think in pictures, this is an excellent one. I see the top half of my head as my conscious mind. The bottom half is the subconscious, and of course, the body's the body. Now, it's the mind that controls the body. The body is like a dumb terminal. It will do whatever the mind tells it to do. It can only do what the mind tells it to do. When there's something wrong in the body, you can rest assured there's something wrong in the mind. When you see a rash break out in the body, and we say it's an allergy, you know that there's a problem in the subconscious mind that's expressing itself, all right? It's a fixed concept and it can be altered. I always say dermatology is the best form of medicine to go into because your patient rarely dies and they never get better, all right? So you just, you just keep saying, try this and come on back uh, for more. Now, the conscious mind is your thinking mind. This is the part of you that you have the ability to think with. Your subconscious is your emotional mind. Your emotions are controlled by the thoughts that you entertain. You choose your thoughts and you think in pictures. You impress the thought upon your subconscious and that causes you to feel the way you feel. Now actually the feeling is conscious awareness of vibration that the body's in. Because whatever is impressed upon the subconscious controls the vibratory rate of the body. The body moves into action, and your actions produce your results. Now, just see, it's the results that most people are trying to change. The results are something outside of us. Now, what we're talking about is the mind, all right? Now, James Allen said, until thought is linked with purpose, there's no intelligent accomplishment. Just the information isn't going to do it. You've got to have a purpose. You've got to have a purpose that is so big, so all-encompassing, that's why you get up in the morning, that's why you go to work. Now your vision is how you're going to execute your purpose and your goal is how you're going to execute your vision. And we'll say, there is the mind, and we'll break it into two parts. Now this is where it starts getting interesting. I. Uh, was looking for this book and I had left it on a chair over here. If you're sitting on that, you've got some great energy flowing through you, I'm gonna tell you. Now, I have been carrying this copy with me since 1963. 
You can see I've had it for a while. Now in here, he said that an educated person is not necessarily a person with an abundance of general or specialized knowledge. An educated person is a person who has so developed the faculties of their mind that they can acquire anything they want or its equivalent without violating the rights of others. How many of you know what the faculties of your mind are? Let me see a show of hands. One, two, isn't this amazing? Hardly anybody knows what they are. How many people have a perfect memory? Just me? <laughs> How many people like to have a perfect memory? Now, you see, I want you to you just to look around. The audience is from different walks of life, different ages, different gender, and, uh, and yet nobody had their hand up for a perfect memory. Do you know that every one of us has a perfect memory? Do you know I could teach you how to memorize this book? There is no such thing as a bad memory. There's only weak memories. Memory is an intellectual factor. And you develop your memory the same as you develop your body through exercise. If I put this arm in a sling and left it there, I think you know in a relatively short period of time, it would be rendered useless. If at the same time I was lifting weights with this arm, I'd have big powerful muscles here. Now it's fairly obvious I haven't done either of these things, but if I had, you, you know exactly what would happen. It's the same with our mind. What happens? People going around, I got such a rotten memory. You don't have a rotten memory at all. You have a perfect memory. Where did you get the idea you had a bad memory? Well, when you were a little kid, you heard your parents say, I got a bad memory. What do you do? I got a bad memory. You just mimic them. There's no such thing as a bad memory. You have many marvelous mental faculties. And he said, an educated person is not necessarily a person with an abundance of general or specialized knowledge. An educated person is a person who has so developed the faculties of their mind that they can acquire anything they want or its equivalent without violating the rights of others. Now we think, oh, we can't have anything we want. Oh, yes, you can. Every religion teaches you that. All science teaches you that. Where'd you get the idea that you can't? Well, you probably got it from your next door neighbor who probably doesn't know much than, more than his next door neighbor. So we have put these two back together, the conscious and the subconscious mind. Now, we have been programmed to live through our senses. We go by what we see, hear, smell, taste, and touch. And that's pretty well the way we were programmed. You see, they are like little antennae that are hooked up to our conscious mind. They're just like antennae, picks up information from our outside world. So this is the way most of us live. We look at our bank account, that tells us where we're at financially. We look at our report card, that tells us where we are intellectually. A report card just tells you where the child's mind was for a few minutes on a given day a few weeks ago. It has nothing to do with the person's level of uh, ability to move ahead. Nothing. Uh, we take IQ tests. IQ will change something like the weather. That, that's true. You can change in a person's IQ. Their intelligent quotient, it can be changed. We know so little about ourselves. You go all through school. We think the important thing in school is to get the person to understand two plus two equal four. That's not the most important thing at all. Person, most important thing is to start to understand yourself. The important thing is to keep the important thing the important thing. Take a look at the next one. Go we'll back that up. Is the will. The will gives us the ability to concentrate. All right. The will gives us the ability to concentrate. I've got a couple of statues of Napoleon in my home. And I think that it's, I have them there for a reason. He reminds me of what I do and what I don't want to be like. Napoleon had a very powerful mind. I don't think he was a very nice guy, but a very powerful mind. One of his biographers called him organized victory. Another one said he had immense capacity for sustained concentration, highly evolved will. The will gives you the ability to hold one idea on the screen of the mind to the exclusion of all outside distractions. The will is what you use when you concentrate. And through concentration, you increase amplitude of vibration. Your energy is more powerful. Okay? Now, the imagination, Hill said it's the most marvelous, miraculous, inconceivably powerful force that the world's ever known. And we've all got one. Let's start using it. Now, we take memory. Memory's perfect. We know what the memory is. I could earn a million dollars so easy it would make your head spin. Earning money is a simple thing to do when you know how. If you don't know how, you could work all your life and not be able to do it. The conscious mind is the intellectual mind, and the conscious mind can think. 
This is really important that we understand this. This is what most people do not do. You just watch the average person. They'd never do what they're doing if they were thinking. They'd never say what they're saying if they're thinking. We have the ability to think. We can tap into an infinite power and we can build any idea in our mind. Now, every great leader, as far back as you can go, have taught us that we become what we think about. What do you think about, all right? Now, you have the ability to accept or reject any idea that comes along. So if you're listening to the news or you're reading the newspaper and they tell you that the economy is going down, you might say, for you, but not for me. This is going to be the best year that I've ever had. During the Great Depression, there was all kinds of people earning millions. Not everybody lost their money. You see, I I'm not trying to flatter you, but coming here Yes, one of the most brilliant things you can do. I was talking to a lady right here at the break, and she was telling me that she got a, a, a cassette or a, a tape from, uh, it was Napoleon Hill's Principles. And she was listening to them. She says, things were going really great. And she said, for some reason, I lost it or stopped listening to it, and things started to go in the other direction. Well, we're so influenced by suggestion. Suggestion is one of the most powerful forces in the universe. And you see, if you come here on a regular basis, just when you start to slide off, it'll bring you back on track again. Now, I think you should listen to this stuff every day. We read the paper every day. We eat food every day. We wash our bodies every day. How about recharging our mind every day? We're dealing with the most potent force in the universe, and we're dealing with the mind. Now, your subconscious mind has no ability to think. It cannot choose. It cannot reject. It can only accept. The conscious mind can reject. You want to reject a lot of the things. When people start to complain, get away from them. I don't want to spend any time with anyone that talks about how bad things are or why things can't be done. Your subconscious mind will accept anything, and whatever goes into the subconscious mind must be expressed through the body. It cannot differentiate between what's real and what's imagined. Hold your hand up like that. Come on, everybody get their hand up like that. Put their hand like that. Put it here in your chin for a second. Will you do that? Now, where's your chin? <laughs> you see? You're thinking. Why did we go here? Because I went there. If I said, let's follow me, and I went off the cliff, would you go? We have a tendency to go by what we see, hear, smell, taste, touch. We do not think. You know that's not your chin. You say, well, you put your hand there. There we go. You see, that's the defense. They did it. All right? Your subconscious mind will accept anything. Now, this is how you and I arrived on the scene. A baby, when a baby's born, its subconscious mind is wide open. You can put anything in it you want. The baby's mind is wide open. Every thought that goes on around the baby is going right into that baby's mind. You were a baby. Go back and ask yourself, what was the environment like that I was raised in? What did the people work at? What was their attitude towards money? What was their attitude towards potential? You see, if we start asking these questions, then we know what's programmed here into our subconscious mind. Now, any idea that goes into our subconscious repetitively becomes fixed in there. That's what we call a conditioned mind. It's a multitude of fixed ideas. Fixed ideas are more commonly called habits, and a multitude of habits are called paradigms. How did we get in the habit of doing things? By the idea going in the subconscious mind. It's the repetition. Do you remember when you first started to drive a car? You probably thought you were going to kill yourself. And so did the person that was teaching you. You know, that's why they were so scared. And, and I mean, it, you, you're having a terrible time to clutch the brake, the gas, you know. And now you're steering with your knee. You're looking for a pen while you're talking on the phone. And you're in traffic. It's the subconscious mind that's doing it. When you're on the highway, your subconscious mind is driving. You're not really paying attention. The subconscious mind's driving. Go to pass a transport truck in the rain when there's a heavy overspray. You go from automatic pilot to conscious and you're holding that wheel and when you get past, you're slacking off and back on the subconscious mind again. See, this is all automatic. Well, you and I were programmed and the problem is we were programmed with their limitations. Where did they get the limitations? From somebody the same way. We've got to understand this. Someone else may have been responsible for making us who we are. We are responsible for changing it. Now, there is thought. It's a thought power is flowing into your consciousness. You can think anything you want, but the paradigm is going to dictate what you're going to do. The thoughts that you think are largely controlled 
by the paradigm. See, if you're conditioned, as I say, to earn 50,000 a year, what are the odds of you thinking of earning 150? You won't seriously think of all, you might dream about it periodically, but you won't seriously think, but you could. As a matter of fact, if you just made up your mind that you were going to, you probably would in a relatively short period of time. If you were going to learn to fly an airplane, what would you do? You wouldn't go to your hairdresser or your butcher or somebody. You'd go to a real good flight instructor and you'd do exactly what they tell you. Why don't we do that with money? That's the one point that everybody's agreed on is you become what you think about, all right? Now, the thought flows in or the power for thought flows in you choose the thought. You can think anything you want. Start to monitor your thinking. And the second you start to get out of the box, the paradigm will cut in. You say, you can't do that. You can't do that. Why can't you do that? Well, you'll come up with reasons why you can't do it. You see? The truth is you can do anything you want to do. Now, paradigms influence your thinking. I'll tell you something else. Paradigms influence what you do. You see, school has been interested in you getting the book into your conscious mind. What is the important thing in school? The important thing in school is that you read the book, you remember what's in the book, and you repeat what's in the book. If you do that, you get the mortarboard of the sheepskin, and they say you're an educated person. There's a lot of educated derelicts walking the street. They remembered what's in the book. It doesn't cut any ice anymore. For a while, we got away with that jazz. There was a lot of money wasted. Companies aren't doing it anymore. If you don't produce, baby, you're on the street. Cry, bitch, complain, do all you want, but you shouldn't have been there. If you're not performing, you don't deserve the reward. It's a simple concept. And if a company's paying for people for non-performance, then the company's going down the tubes. School has us programmed to believe if we can repeat it, we've got it. Well, that ain't so because you can repeat all kinds of stuff, but the paradigm still controlling your behavior. You see, school gave us the knowledge. However, school never taught us how to alter the paradigms. If you don't learn how to alter the paradigms, it's never gonna happen. Got to alter the paradigm. See, you want to improve your results, or you wouldn't come here. I don't think you're coming here because you had nothing to do. I think you're all very busy. The people that have nothing to do, they wouldn't come here. It's a bit of a paradox. They're the ones that need it more than you do. All right? Now, what does the program tell us to do? This is the way we are programmed. The starting point is results. We look at the results we're getting. The results cause us to think the thoughts we're thinking. This is a formula for losing, by the way. But this is the way we operate. You look at the x-ray. You look at the bank account. You look at the present relationship. If you're letting present results control your thinking, you're on a losing track. The thoughts cause the feelings. The feelings cause the action, and the action produces more of the same. If you're having financial problems today, you probably were a year ago. If the student's getting an AD average in school, they probably did last year. We think we've got to cram more information. No, 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 no. Put the books away. Sit down, teach them something about themselves. Get them to see themselves as an honor student. Get them to relax, totally relax when they write the exam. They've got all the information there and it'll flow out. They've got to start to see themselves as worthy of the good life that they desire. When I left public school, Miss Strawn, who was a nice lady, she said, B, Bob, where are you going to go? And I said, I'm going to Malvern Collegiate. Oh, Bob, 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 don't, don't do that. Go on over to Danforth Tech, get a trade. You'll never do well in the business world. I got people like Price Waterhouse, Prudential, some of the largest companies in the world. They'll pay me on the ass to go in and work with their executives. And I would never do well. Miss Strawn was wrong, but I believed what she said until I was 26. And consequently, I never tried to get a good job. I always had a dumb job, hated the job. I remember working for a guy in the west end of Toronto. He was not a nice man. He really was not a nice man. And of course, I was poor as a church mouse, so I didn't have, even have a car. And I had to go from the east end to the west end in busy traffic and, and in cold weather all the way across the city to work for a guy I really didn't like to do something I absolutely hated. And all the way there, I was afraid I was going to get fired. <laughs> now, this is nuts. This is insanity. Do you know that there's a lot of people like that? Right in this building, there's people like that. Doesn't make any sense. They're starting with the wrong end. They're letting the present results control them. Think of this for a moment. Your starting point should be ideas. 
Let's let the present results dictate where we've been at. Let's learn something about ourselves. Let's start with the idea, the idea in our mind. What do you really want? Let that idea then dictate how you feel. How you feel is going to control how you act, and how you act is going to produce the results that you're getting. That's the way you improve the results. And then you look at the improved results, you adapt to the change, to the change in the condition, circumstance, and environment, and then you start out with a new idea. You see, it all boils down to decisions. It really does. You got to make the decision that you're going to change. But many of you come here and you go back and you do exactly the same thing. I want to suggest that you make a decision today. You make a decision that you're going to change the whole deal. We don't know how long it takes to reach a goal, although we guess fairly accurately. And that is governed by a law of gender. The law of gender decrees that all seeds have a gestation or an incubation period. When you plant a seed, you don't get the flower or the fruit right away. When the seed for the baby is planted, it takes approximately 280 days. Well, remember where the non-physical and the physical is all hooked together? Well, the idea is a spiritual seed. It's made from exactly the same stuff the physical seed's made from, and it's subject to exactly the same law. We just have not developed the awareness of what the gestation period is, so we guess. And oddly enough, we guess fairly accurately. Everything else on the goal card should be written in the present tense. I am so happy and grateful. You've already got it in your conscious mind. And as you get emotionally involved, you've already got it in your emotional mind. And it's only a period of time till it moves into form. You've got to make the decision. So you start out. Your goal. That's the idea. You see the goal. This is where I am. And then that will dictate the kind of feelings you have. You see? That'll dictate your actions. And that'll produce the win. Then you big, build another big, new, exciting goal. Now this is all, it's so basic and it's so simple and yet so misunderstood. But you can understand it. You see, you want to make the connection between your mind and your prospect's mind or the other person's mind because that's where you make the connection. You make it on a mental plane. That's where the sales made. Those of you who are in sales, it's all made. It's a mental thing. It's not we think, may think it's physical. It's not physical at all. The physical is just the expression of something that's already happened. You want to practice about 15 minutes a day. Get your, get your performance down pat. I know a few movie stars that are pretty big ones. And you know something? They do this so beautifully. It's called imagined reality. When you watch a movie star at work, they're living the part. You see, they're, they're not just reading a script. They're not just repeating memory work. They took the script, they read it, they reread it, they reread it, they memorized it, they internalized it, they became it. Yet yeah, it's perfect. That's what we want to do. We want to write our own script. And most people don't understand that. Now, this is very important. We're going to go through it very fast. You're either living in ignorance or with knowledge. Now, we're all living in both. We know certain things, and there's certain things we don't know. Now, let's stop and think, because this is very powerful. You can think anything you want. Most people that don't understand something, they have a tendency to doubt and worry. Doubt and worry. They have taken a power that was unadulterated, it was without form, and we've given it form, a negative form. We built a negative picture. We take and we internalize that negative picture. It sets up the only emotional state it can set up, sets up a vibration of fear. Now, fear can only be expressed through the instrument that you're living in, your body. And so it man expresses itself in what we call anxiety. Now, anxiety is not expressed, it's suppressed. Yet the suppression then turns to depression. This person's on a losing track, don't even know what they're doing. The depression turns to disease, and the disease turns to disintegration. Now, that's a process. That happens so fast, the person doesn't even know what's going on. And you know what's causing it? Ignorance is their problem. What are they taking for the anxiety? Valium or something like that. We got them on Prozac or Valium or some other drug so that we got them so stupefied that they don't even know they're doing it to themselves. Should we educate them? I think so. What is education? To induce, to develop, or to draw from an end. Let's bring out something in the person. Let's go back to our thinking. We want to develop understanding. There is only one way to develop understanding and you're doing it, you're studying. There is no other way of developing understanding. That's what these programs are all about. Solomon said, in all you're getting, get understanding. Now, the well-being is expressed. 
You don't hear somebody that it's really in a great vibration. You say, hi, how are you? And they, I'm really excited. You know, they don't do that. You see it in the way they walk. You see it in the way they talk. You see it the way they meet and greet people. They're alive and they know it. That turns to acceleration. They're picking up speed. This is the way the universe operates. You know why? Because they're at ease. They're not uptight. The person that's anxious and depressed, their body is, it's no wonder their heart snaps. Take your fist and crunch it tight, see how long you can keep it that way. That's the way some people's bodies are. Well, you want to put your body in a totally relaxed state. And then this power flows freely through you. No kinks in the hose. And I'm going to tell you, you'll have lots of juice flowing and you're going to feel like a million bucks. And you become very creative. And that's called creation. You see? Now, what do you think about? What do you spend your time thinking about? Most people spend their time thinking about just whatever's going on around them in, in a given period of time. Now we say to ignore the power of paradigms to influence your judgment is to put yourself at risk when exploring the future. This idea of paradigms, you've got to understand it. You want to get back into that stick person. Can you change your paradigms? Yeah, you sure can. Yeah, you sure can. And you see, when you know you can change your paradigms, you have hope. See, I was controlled. I was unhappy, sick, and broke, and I was lost. I had no hope. Why? Well, I just couldn't see how it could happen. You know what Ray gave me? He gave me hope. And you know what happens when you have hope? That means that you have options. Now, what a difference. I love this. What a different story people would have to tell if they would adopt a definite purpose and stand by that purpose until it had time to become an all-consuming obsession. I love that book. I truly love it. Most people are extras in their own movie. They really are. You know, it's sad. They write the script, they're the casting agent, they're the director, they're the producer, they're the executive producer. They do the whole deal. And they give themselves maybe a walk-on, maybe a line if they're really gregarious. But most of them just stand there and they look at the stars. They think, God, I wish I could do that. We could do anything, anything we want. See, what we want to do is say, what do I really want? Not what do I think I can do, what can I afford, what do I want? Life is not a practice run, you know. You're not going to get another bite at the apple. This is the deal. This is it. I remember one time we were down in Atlanta on a speaking engagement when I worked with uh, the Nightingale Corporation, and Earl got up and slowly started to move across the room. And somebody said, what are you doing? He said, I was just thinking, that's the way most people go through life. They tiptoe through life, hoping they make it safely to death. <laughs> it's true. That's the way most people live. We want to step out and do the thing we really love. Now. Here's a lesson for you on goals that is absolutely incredible. So you'll want to remember it. Most people, when they're setting goals, they set goals to do what they know how to do. That way it's safe. They're going sideways, but it's safe. You remember we talked about the level of awareness, how you reach? We said goals are to cause you to stretch. That's the purpose. The goal isn't to accumulate. You go, money's not to accumulate. I never have enough money, never. Do you know why? I'm always doing something beyond where I'm at. That's what keeps me growing. I want to extend what I'm doing. I want to get another deal going. And everybody said, gee, why don't you slow down? Uh-uh, I want to do it. And so you've got, and then you've got to attract more, you see? You've got to keep going. Quit going after things you know how to do. Now, understand this. People do not resist change. They don't. Do you know what people resist? Being changed. See, if I try and force change on you, the wall comes down. But if you decide to change, no problem. We say people resist change, they really don't. They resist being changed. Now, let me tie this into that. You hang out with people that you're comfortable with. You're on the same frequency as them. What we say feeling was conscious awareness of vibration. So you, you hang out with people that are in the same vibration as yourself. If you're miserable, you're not happy with happy people. You gotta be with miserable people. If you're happy, you're not happy with miserable people. You gotta be with happy people. You don't find the big producers hanging out with the little producers. 
and you don't find the little producers hanging out with the big producers. You don't find rich people living in the slums. You don't find people that have no money living in where rich people live. You are attracted to people who are in harmony with you. That's the law of attraction. That's the way it works. Like energy attracts like energy. Now, the people you're mixing with, if you're setting goals to do how you know how to do, that's where they're at. Now, when you go to move ahead and you say, I'm going to go after something bigger and better. And as you go after it, they don't want you to. If you gave them a polygraph and really sucked the truth out of them, they want you to win, but they don't want you to leave. Do you know why? They would have to adapt to your absence. They don't want to do that. They don't want you to leave. Do they want you to win? Yeah, but they don't want you to leave. And you can't win if you don't leave. You're thinking, geez, this is true. You can relate to this. Now, we sit down. We, we, we're going to stretch. We're going to go after what I think I can do. And we get our slide rule out. And we get the whole deal. And we get the plan. You've got to have a plan. Wharton teaches you've got to have a plan. Uh, Harvard, you've got to have a plan. So we get this plan. Then we go down to the, the office place. And we get a folder. And we print it out on our color computers. And we got our pie charts and our, and our uh, graphs. And yet it's all in color. We've got a plan. Man, are we proud of our plan. But you know something? We don't go anywhere. You know why? No inspiration. Here we're going after something we think we can do. God, we're stretching, but there's no inspiration. And there's no support. The person that you're leaving isn't going to support you. And you're not inspired because you're just doing what you think you can do. You got the plan, though. But the plan ain't going to do you any good. It just won't work. Now, if you go after what you want, you're going to fantasize. And you've been taught that's a no-no. When you were a little tiny girl or boy, you could fantasize. You, the mom would just leave you there and let you play with the pots and pans. And you did all kinds of great things with them. And you were fantasizing. But when you went to school, the teacher come down, pay attention. You were being bad. You weren't paying attention. Your mind was wandering. You left the room. You left your body there. Man, you're on a trip. And they punished you. Now, you don't have to punish the person for so long, they'll stop doing whatever it is that they're doing to get punished for. So now we have these great big companies. We've got little wee creative departments. Why? We don't want people to be fantasizing. Fantasy is where everything started. This building was nothing but a fantasy at one time. Somebody got the idea of putting a whole bunch of theaters under one roof. They said it'll never work. So we go from what we know we can do to what we think we can do. But there's no inspiration. And so we go back to what we know we can do. And we get bored there, and we go back to what we think we can do, but there's no inspiration, no support, till we go back to what we know we can do. You see? And that's the end of the story. We're all screwed up, and we don't win. You see? <laughs> but the seminar said, choose a goal. I choose the goal. It's what I thought I could do. Got to play it safe. You got to be realistic. This realistic jazz is for the birds. All right? Look here. Here's the three stages of creating the life you want. And if you want to go after what you want, you've got to fantasize. So you start out here, and you build a fantasy. And you see yourself doing what you want. It doesn't matter how you're going to do it, you build the fantasy. You see the picture. Build the, it doesn't matter where the money is. Now you've got to turn that fantasy into a theory. Before you can turn it into a goal, you've got to pass a test. The theory, now it's an idea in our conscious mind. We're really putting our higher faculties to work on it, but we've got to pass a test. We've got to ask, am I able to do this? If all things are possible, if this is an orderly universe, and if we have all the power within us, yes, I'm able to do it. Don't know how, haven't got the foggiest idea, up to here in debt, don't know where the money's coming, but yes, I'm able to do it. The second question, am I willing? Am I willing what? Am I willing to pay the price? If you're not prepared to pay the price, you don't deserve the reward. I remember my wife started her own business and she was over her head and I would go into the bedroom. Sometimes she'd actually get into bed and get under the covers and pull them over her head. She literally did that. And I'd go in and say, what the hell are you doing? I'm scared. No. Well, what are you scared of? I don't know. Well, I said, why don't you quit? Well, then <laughs> she'd get angry and she'd end up and away she'd go. You see? And now she's got to the point where a little bit of fear doesn't bother her anymore. Now, did I do the same thing? Well, I didn't get in bed and hide under the covers. But 
God, I used to pull the drapes. Ooh, it was terrible. Am I willing? You've got to be willing to pay the price. If you're not willing to pay the price, you don't deserve the reward. You've got to be willing to come to these meetings. You've got to be willing to invest in the programs. You've got to be willing to do that. If you're not, you don't deserve the reward. Now, the second you answer yes to those questions, now you've got a goal and you want to impress it upon the universal subconscious mind. And when you do, the entire universe comes to your aid. That may sound like a bizarre statement, but I'm going to tell you, if I had a year to explain it, I could break it all down. That's exactly what happens. If you have to attract somebody from China, you will attract them. We're not in this room by accident. You know, we're all supposed to be here right now. You're always in the right place for the right reason at the right time. And that idea will begin to move into form and it'll turn into what we call a fact. And when you've done that, then you're in the position to build bigger and better fantasies. And that's called a creative process. You don't have to know how you're going to do it. You only have to know you're going to do it. So here's the deal. You start out, you fantasize. You see it. You believe it. And you do it. How do you think that guy got up that wall? You think when he was standing at the bottom, he knew every step he was going to take to get to the top? Not on your Nelly, did he? He knew that he was going to get to the top of the wall. And he said, I'll put this pick in here, and I'll put this one in here. I'll bring this foot up here and this one up here. That's the first step. He adapted to the change in his condition, circumstance, environment, and then he picked the next step. And that's how he got right to the top of the wall. And that's how Hillary got to the top of the mountain. And that's how Edison built the light bulb. And that's how the Wright brothers got the plane off the ground. And that's how we built the internet. And you want to know something? That's how you're going to create the life you want, a step at a time. Yet you're always going where you don't know, and it's scary. But I believe if you're not living on the edge, you're taking up too much room. You know? <laughs> you're going to know where you're going, and you're going to know you're going to get there. Isn't that how we did it? Do you know what Dr. Warner Von Braun said when John Kennedy asked him what it would take to build a rocket to the moon? He said, the will to do it. That was it. Nightingale said that success is the progressive realization of a worthy ideal. You gotta have an idea that you really want. It's gotta be big and so big and so all consuming that you don't have time to listen to the ne'er-do-wells. You don't have time to listen to the people that don't have time to live. What do you really want? Now get this. Praxis is the integration of belief with behavior. You say you believe things, and yet your behavior would indicate you've never heard of it. We've got to integrate our belief with our behavior. It's very important. You have your conscious mind, and you build a belief. And you impress that belief upon your subconscious mind. Now understand this, there's going to be a bit of a war. How many believe what I've explained here today? Say you believe it because you know it's the truth and you hear the truth, you know it, you see? There's a problem when we go to execute that and it's the old controlling belief that's in there. We've been taught to believe that there's certain things we can't do. We've been taught that because of this or because of that, it won't work. I'll give you a good book to get and read. Go and read Up From Slavery by Booker T. Washington. There's a guy that, I mean, he had all the strikes against him, but he had an image and he just kept going and he did whatever he did and he did it well. He's quoted as saying, if I'm washing floors, when people look at it, they're going to know that Booker T. Washington washed this floor. Everything he did, and that's the way we want to do it. We want to do it to the best of our ability and we want to gain an understanding. The way to do that is to continue to study. So here's the overview of what we've done. Power flows in. And number one, we build an image. Number two, we plant that image in our subconscious mind. That image then is expressed through the only instrument it can be expressed through our physical body. That is an absolute law. It is an absolute law. The image you impress upon your subconscious controls your vibration. 
and your vibration controls what you attract into your life. And you're attracting stuff into your life. Everything that's coming into your life, you're attracting. So don't be afraid to step out. Maslow said you're either going to step forward into growth or you're going to step back into safety. See? When we talk about the science of getting rich, we want to understand that there is a science to getting rich. I want to tell you a story. I was flying to Malaysia and I was playing with the calculator. I always play on a plane with words or numbers. Now, if you go to Kuala Lumpur from Toronto, it's 25 hours in the air. That's a long ride. If you go any further, you're coming back. So, you know, you've got quite a trip that you're taking. Well, at any rate, I'm on the plane and I'm fooling around and I write a million dollars down, just one and six zeros. And I thought a million. And I had earned a million. I had earned a million a year a long time ago. And I know a lot of people that have earned a million bucks. And most of them are not overly bright, you know. Uh, and, and there's some of them who are absolutely brilliant, but they're not all that bright. And, and, and where I may be fairly bright today, but relative to where I was, man, I'm telling you, I was one of the stupidest guys in town, but I was earning all this money. So it has nothing to do with being bright or anything like that. It's a decision. And so I'm on the plane, and I'm thinking, what do these people do? And I started to think about the people that earn a million. What do they do that is so different? Well, first of all, they just decide they're going to do it. And um, then they step out and do it. And they come from all different walks of life. But all the ones that I knew that did it are all locked into this. Michael and I were talking, we were talking about people being seminar junkies. And I said, you know, I've been a seminar junkie for 40 some years. And um, I, I wouldn't want to be any other way. I feel sorry for the people that are not. Because you see, that is a very crude way of saying that a person's really into the development of themselves. Well, I took a look at the people that earned the money and I thought every one of them without exception are really locked into studying. They never stop studying. They have just magnificent libraries of uh, CDs and now DVDs and cassettes. I've got it right back to the records uh, and the old record players. I've got them all. I've kept them all. Um, the, the record player they used to drive around with in uh, Vic Conant's office in Chicago, I took it down and gave it to him one day. But, you know, I thought, we should teach people to earn a million. And so when I got off the plane, now this is way back 1990, I got off the plane and I got on the phone. And I phoned uh, Mark Victor Hansen, and then I phoned Val Vandewal, who's gone now. And I mean, it was the middle of the night here, but I wasn't thinking of that. It was, the clock had turned around. And I got them out of bed, but I got excited, and I was telling them what I was going to do. And they said, Jesus, great idea. So there was a bunch of us. There was Jack and Jack Canfield and Mark Victor and uh, Vandewal and Lee Pouis. And there was a group of us, and we put together a program, and we taught it in Hawaii. And we were teaching people to earn more money. Now, we knew how to earn it, and we were teaching the other people how to earn it. And one of the things we were teaching them is you've got to lock in to study. You've got to study every day. We eat every day. We wash ourselves every day. We get dressed every day. There's certain things we do every day that's religious. You've got to study every day. You've got to allocate a part of your income and a part of your time to your own development. And that was part of the lesson. And, and they all knew that we did. I mean, take that born, that Think and Grow Rich book. I mean, I, I read that every day. So at any rate, we started, and, and Jack and Mark come up with an idea, and they said, Proctor, we're going to do a book. And uh, we had brainstorming sessions going, and they said, you've got lots of stories, give us some stories. And uh, he said, we're going to write a book. And there was a gal there, Cindy Spitzer. I remember, I don't know if she ever got credit for this, but she was from over on the East Coast, around Philadelphia somewhere, and she said, you should call that chicken soup for the soul. And so they're going to write 101 stories, and uh, they were going to pack it and sell it. And I said, that's a pretty cool idea. And, and, and Mark says, we're going to sell 50 million before the turn of the century. And I'm thinking, well, you know, I'm a pretty good thinker, but that seems like a little far out to me. I mean, if you sell a million bucks, you're doing pretty good, but 50 million, and you're going to do it before the turn of the century? Well, they didn't sell 50 million, they sold 74 million. And it was considered the publishing phenomena of the decade. Now, get this, they didn't write anything. They never wrote any books, none. They had other people writing the story, sending them in. They had somebody else collating, somebody else editing, somebody else publishing, somebody else selling, and they got the money. You know why? It was their idea. Now, this came about, it's called intellectual property, and it came about because they study and they expanded their mind. And that's what you're doing here. Now, we said that most people are extras in their own movie. You're no different than Mark or Jack or Bob or Lee or anybody else. You're exactly the same as them. And what you want to do is make up your mind when you go home, you're going to lock in and you're going to get your chicken soup concept.
You know that 66% of what I've said you'll forgotten by tomorrow morning? 90 to 100% of it will be gone within a month. But if you keep repetition, if you keep programming it into your mind, you're going to find that you'll start to do it. That's what the actors do. I know a number of actors, pretty big names. And you know something? They're ordinary folks just like you and me, but they become great actors because they program the script into their mind until they become the script. And that's what you want to do.